It's my pleasure today to be joined by Monica Stazuska Crook, who is the founder of Corvus Innovation and coach and course facilitator in the Stanford LEAD program. Monica, thank you so much for joining me today on the Real Clear Values podcast. Thank you very much, Tom, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice and early as we're recording it in <laughs> Poland and England, respectively. Exactly. It's 8.49 uh, a.m., but the sun is not shining yet, but let's hope we will have some of it uh, later in our chat. Here's hoping, eh? Monica, I was really interested in your profile because you took a module on the Stanford course that you are now facilitating on teaching on based on power. And I'm really interested in talking to you about that, especially in relation to values, because power is one of those things which is so taboo. It's seen as such a messy subject and something that nobody really wants to talk about, at least directly. So in terms of the course itself, when you took the course at Stanford, what expectations did you have of that particular module? How did you feel about taking it? And what was it that, that provoked you to, to choose to take it in the first place? That's a great question. First and foremost, um, it has been proclaimed to be one of the best courses within Stanford and definitely one of the most popular ones, uh, not only within the LEAD program, but as I understand also within the MBA program. Some called it life-changing. And uh, honestly speaking, I can understand why. And I'm sure in the course of our conversation, it, it will become clear why I think that. Uh, some called it polarizing. So it's almost either you love it and become evangelist of it or you hate it. It's very difficult to stay lukewarm, so mm. to speak. So that sounded very intriguing already to start with. Uh, and definitely the persona of the professor who is the author of the course, uh, Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, he has um, something which I would describe as celebrity-like status in terms of questions of power. He has been writing on the topic and researching the topic for many, many years now with very prominent colleagues. So uh, listening to such authority definitely had its appeal. Plus, I was really curious to understand why there is such a buzz created around this course, what sort of added value it can bring. Mm -hmm. I have a history myself of finishing two master degrees and also an MBA. So I thought to myself, what you know else potentially I can learn there? But there were many surprises to come, uh, many, um, I would say, um, discoveries to make, but I'm sure we'll get to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so interesting. So you'd already done a lot of education when you went into the Stanford program. And many people would look at something like an MBA and think, well, that's it. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the be all and end all of business education. So, so why do any more? And you looked at this particular module with Jeffrey Pfeffer and said, right, I want to do this one. So talk us through how you found the module in practice once you actually started to get into it. So the module itself fundamentally is built around Professor Pfeffer's book uh, with a very provocative title, Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't. And everything centers around going through the certain, let's say, learning certain lessons and life cases that Professor captured in the book. But additionally, and quite prominently, the course has extremely broad practical component, meaning you need to get your hands dirty mm -hmm. and literally every module you need to go out there and test one of the strategies described in the book. And that literally means very often going very far out of your comfort zone um, and discovering completely new areas or completely new behaviors that you haven't tried before. Uh, some compared it, and, and I think it's very vivid metaphor, some compared it to actually diving into matrix mm. and taking this um, mythical red pill, because, you know, if we think about the meaning of the red pill, it's basically the willingness to learn potentially, you know, unsettling or life-changing truth, mm. uh, which with which later you will have to live. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, to kind of provide broader context, I think to your comments, why why Stanford lead after MBA and, and master degrees? First of all, I think one of the characteristics of the people that I've met within lead community is that they are really 
focused on continuous development, on uh, growing exponentially, uh, never stop learning, never stop uh, exploring new ideas. And that was very apparent based on discussions that we had on the forum, based on the interactions we had within the groups, based on the live sessions that we had. And when I saw the whole curriculum of Stanford LEAD program, there are many prominent courses, you know, as strong as power and as popular as power. I know the, the theme of today's podcast uh, uh, is around power. However, the course and the program itself was absolutely uh, eye-opening. So this is as an explanation why on earth I decided to continue after, after an MBA. Um, and in a way... The course itself, coming back to power, um, as apart from giving you this mythical red pill, I can also mention that sometimes you, you know that there are certain brutal realities um, mm. about the environment that surrounds us. But honestly, it's sometimes at some point difficult to internalize it or we do not want to internalize it because that would mean that the world is not so beautiful as we all hope for it to be. And um, then, honestly, seeing that printed out or list hearing that from somebody uh, else makes you really stop, sit up and listen and internalize this information. And I think this is the one of the life-changing elements of that particular course that it tells, um, let's say, the story, how reality looks like, how the gaining power process looks like, and therefore, what are the consequences for all of us? Yeah, very interesting. I'm, I'm interested to dig into your experience of the red mm -hmm. pill. What was the red pill experience for you? What were the biggest light bulbs that went off in, in your mind that were maybe not so comfortable that actually made you think this is valuable information and I'd rather know this truth and work within its parameters, work with it rather than unconsciously work against it or have it work against me? Uh, that's a great question. Actually, I've heard it repeated multiple times from the students in, in that particular course, saying that I wish I read the book, I wish I've taken this course 20 years ago, mm. uh, because it has such a prominent influence on the way how we perceive power, how we understand its importance, how we also, let's say, dig out certain tools. Uh, for me specifically, let me put it like that. Uh, although I knew that the course is polarizing, uh, although I knew, let's say, all the story that I mentioned at the very beginning, I made a very conscious promise to myself to actually focus on making the most of it. So do not shy away from the strategies that will be discussed and honestly go for it and try it with my own hands uh, and see the results, you know, for myself. because. At the end of the day, this is a key to success in all the courses in that particular program, but I, I think also more universally in life than unless you try, you wouldn't honestly know whether particular behavior or particular strategy will actually work for you, will do you good. So um, I really plunged into it. Uh, I was very meticulous. Uh, I organized for myself a plan, let's say a whole power building strategy down to very meticulous detail. Uh, mm. As an anecdote, I had an Excel file where I literally traced every step, uh, every task which I want to progress. And I made a color coding whether I made any progress any given week or not. Mm. So persistence definitely kind of. I would say counted or um, was something that was needed in order to go through with it. But the other element quite vital, which professor calls getting over oneself, mm. um, is effectively accepting the fact that some of the, let's say, truths spelled out in the book might be at the beginning difficult to swallow, but the key success factor is to kind of get over that particular barrier, almost like get out of own way and really mm. plunge into trying. Mm. Uh, almost like learning to swim. I mean, you can uh, read a lot of books, you can uh, watch other people do it, but unless you try, you will never learn. I mean, mm. I seldom heard about people who were able to do that first, first go. Uh, so, um, 
the one of the elements probably that that uh, was really prominent at the very beginning it was a question of networking i think we uh, to some extent a lot of us will have certain hesitation like what if i reach out to a certain person i know very little or i do not know at all what will be the reaction of this person how would i look like what this person think of me and then I um, suddenly I internalized one of the key messages um, out there in the course. Well, what if? What's the worst thing that can happen? You will not hear from the person or the person will say, I'm not interested. But how worse off it will make you? And suddenly you realize it wouldn't make you worse off. Actually, mm-hmm. you will be at the same point where you started at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. So is, is that what, is, sorry to interrupt that, is, is that what he meant by getting over yourself, the need exactly. to, to put yourself out there and be more proactive in, in connecting with other people? Exactly. So that was probably one of the very first kind of milestones or very first roadblocks that you need to step over yeah. in order to be able to continue with the, with the next strategy. And uh, it's really rewarding because when you internalize the fact that uh, when you ask, you are actually already better off because at least you gave it a try mm. and you will be surprised in how many instances it actually worked seamlessly. So yes. that was that was probably the, the element number two. Uh, the element number three was around flattery, which is mentioned as one of the strategies to build relationship or to get, uh, let's say, um, attention of people. Uh, mm-hmm. And there were also uh, some interesting learnings associated with that. Uh, I quite quickly realized that it works really well because, let's face it, all of us like to hear more about ourselves. And this is a <laughs> sure. favorite topic of anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's very easy to tap into something interesting when you will talk about other person. But there is a, how to put it, a risk or pivot that you need to keep in mind that uh, it needs to be sincere. It needs Mm. to be authentic. It needs to be tailor-made. It will not work or it will work poorly if you do it as a cookie cutter approach. So you just copy paste certain statement and hope for the best. Uh, That's not the way to do it. However, there are many techniques to uh, be you know, nice to someone uh, based on the legitimate achievements, legitimate goals achieved by other person. Mm. Uh, we know about it now through uh, social media, so it's not that difficult to get to that information. And building on it, congratulating somebody on the new article or interesting uh, LinkedIn post or new role, uh, that is all you know, within our reach, uh, it's not a huge time investment and can become a start of building a stronger relationship or opening up a new relationship. Mm. So mm. Uh, in my experience, I would say that on 10 attempts at flattery, nine of them worked, yeah, meaning wow. I got some sort of reaction, either acknowledgement or a reply or message or coffee invite, you name it. Of course, reactions were different yeah. depending how close you are to the person where where you kind of you know try the strategy on. But nevertheless, it, it works miracles, and honestly, it's a almost risk free strategy because uh, there is no downside. Mm. Worst case scenario, if somebody says, "Okay, I do not want to kind of connect," but at the same time, what a nice girl Monica is, or a nice lady. She thinks so highly of me. She must be very smart not to see that. <laughs> and uh, this is, let's say, the self-fulfilling prophecy almost. So when my name pops up yet again, there will be a positive association kind of with it. So mm. uh, that's just, uh, you know, one of the examples. Yeah, I, I was going to mention on that point, Monica, and I'm glad you mentioned about sincerity because it leads into a question that I've got about integrity because mm-hmm. there are people appreciating what professor pfeffer says about getting over yourself there are people who want to maintain integrity and don't want to don't want to be untrue when they're they're speaking with people but actually as i understand from how you've relayed it and i've read the book as well you can do this and maintain your integrity you don't have to lie to people you don't have to make up false reasons for liking something or you know, telling someone that you really like something when actually really dislike it, you can actually go to them with genuine, genuine praise with the 
intention of actually wanting to build a relationship rather than being this Machiavellian schemer who who just has this this spreadsheet with all these names and this master plan of who they're going to build relationships with to take over the world. Is, is that fair to say that, that you can do this and maintain ma- maintain your integrity and do this sincerely as well? That's a brilliant point. And actually one of the sentences that Professor Pfeffer repeats behind the scenes, let's say, but not only behind the scenes during lectures as well, is that uh, you need to kind of stop judging people because you will not have enough time to love them. And Mm. I think this is the deepest underlying essence of power and deepest underlying essence of certain values that can stand Mm. behind it. Because strategies are like one element, uh, Mm. but then power, if you look at it, um, you know, from a philosophical perspective, Mm -hmm. let's face it, it's just a tool, uh, like a hammer. Yes. If you if you really want, you can kill somebody with a hammer. You can kill another human being. But at the same time, with the same hammer, you can build a house. Mm. You can build an animal shelter. So it depends on you what sort of goals you will leverage the power for. It depends on you how you are going to um, you know leverage that. How you are going to use it, uh, and therefore also what sort of values will be you know, deep-rooted underneath it all. And what I've noticed that if you pay attention to another, you know, human being in a, a either private or professional setting, sooner or later you will find elements that you really admire, um, even in the person who at the first glance has very little uh, in common with you, but you will find certain behaviors, certain achievements, certain goals, certain beliefs that you mm-hmm. can relate to. Sometimes it takes uh, more digging. Sometimes it's apparent at the first glance uh, and then, you know, your job is super easy. But it is possible to still be authentic because, as I said, I think then, for example, the flattery works actually best because if it's just, uh, you know, copy-paste from one person to the other, the recipient sooner or later will notice that. that mm. It's not sincere, that it's generic, that anybody can say that, and it's not interesting. It's not a, a good conversation starter. But the more you make it about this person, the more you pay attention to the other person, I think that's the key, mm. uh, the more the person will be open to share more with you and you will have more chances to discover things that you really like. Uh, because, um, let me put it like this, In networking, it's a lot about giving. There are several cases within the book and actually within the course which mention that building network and actually leveraging network is about offering something, offering true value to those who are in your network. So uh, as an example, uh, when I was kind of at some point really wanting to to give something back to, to my network, I posted on LinkedIn a statement that I would like to offer kind of my services as a mentor to two talented individuals who didn't have one or who find my profile appealing and want to to work with me together. Uh, honestly, I didn't expect much of a um, you know reply or much much of an interest. Uh, to be absolutely frank, and I was absolutely surprised. Mm. Why? Because first of all, I was flooded with requests to become a mentor. And on the other hand, I was it, it's a very positive thing. I was also flooded with proposals from others to become a mentor. Mm. So in other words, suddenly I was in the middle of the network, so to speak. On one hand, having those who, who want to learn and on the other, those who want to give back. Mm. So I mm, landed in a position of something which I would call a matchmaker. Yeah. Meaning I decided I cannot help everyone because, uh, well, the day has 24 hours for yeah. all of us. So what I did, I um, kind of ex- extended the request to the other mentors who raised their hands and started to mix and match those mentees and those mentors who had similar interests, similar industries or the skills that the mentee wanted to learn. Mm. Uh, at this point, let me see, I matched, I think, 14 happy pairs working uh, together and I also um, had the immense pleasure of uh, coaching and mentoring two wonderful ladies 
who as a result now changed jobs as a, as a result of our, uh, let's say, working process together. That's but the, but the, but the point is that um, it was genuinely giving something which had value to other people. Mm. I was overjoyed because on one hand, my network was growing and it was growing almost immediately with quite strong connections because those were people who were either open enough to offer something to others or open mm. enough to ask for help. So that was a beautiful you know, opening line for the conversation. And uh, it also allowed... For, for it to unveil, for it to continue, and for the relationship to grow. Uh, on the other hand, I genuinely helped people because I see how mentees are growing, how mentors are feeling, you know, rewarded by the fact that they are giving back. Mm. So, you know, what's not to like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it's very interesting talking about this because a comment along the lines of, don't be too judgmental of people because then you don't have any room to love them. That That's not a, a very power-oriented comment to make. It's not something that we typically orient or associate with conversations about power and the pursuit of power. So thinking about what it's led to for you and perhaps the, the broader picture as well, why should we pursue power? Why should we make it our business to pursue power? Or to put it more simply in relation to values, why is pursuing power a good thing? Uh, well, there are several elements to it, I would say. I mean, first of all, um, I think we differ on how we see the definition of power. Uh, because if we look you know, at Webster Dictionary, it's a, literally ability to produce certain effect. And I think there is a lot of truth to it because my personal definition of it is the ability to get things done. Mm. Uh, so, again, it's a question of what goal we are pursuing. It might be, you know, it might be a selfish one, let's face it, let's not sugarcoat it. Mm. But on the other hand, it might be also a very noble thing to do and very kind of beautiful goal to go after. And without power... You know, it would be difficult to get things going or to, you know, enable those this machinery to, to start moving. So I think it's it's one of the reasons. And second, whether we would like it or not, the whole environment around us is some sort of power play. Whether we acknowledge that, whether we see that at mm -hmm. the first glance, it is. Uh, either in, uh, you know, if you are in the corporate world, probably that's the easiest one to see because you have a whole hierarchy within the organization, whether it's matrix one or more traditional one, you will have certain uh, resources which are scarce, you will have certain power struggles around those resources, you will have conflicting objectives, um, etc. So you are in the middle of it, whether you want it or mm -hmm. not. So that's point number one. But that extends also you know, even to a freelancing, because again, you have your clients, you have your <clears throat> uh, suppliers, you might have your colleagues, and again, the same kind of uh, interactions come into focus. And uh, uh, even in our communities, you want to kind of find your place in uh, in your um, friends group or a place in your uh, local community. And as a result, there is also a certain hierarchy, you know, how it works. Why? Because studies show that in terms of the way how human society is evolving, we tend to gravitate towards hierarchies. Why? Because they make certain things easier. They put mm. certain chaos in order. Yes. And whenever we see certain order and certain cues that enable us to, uh, you know, react in a specific way or to behave in a specific way, uh, that's something we are going to strive at. So in other words, we are part of this big, you know, chess game, whether we like it or not. Mm. And it's up to us to decide whether we want to be passive about it and just, you know, yeah. take things as they are, or we want to change something about it. And mm. that's probably one of the most liberating elements of, of that particular course. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's like that saying goes, don't don't hate the player, hate the game, or, or or something something to that effect. But almost almost in inverse, where you have to accept the fact that the game is being played, it's going on around you. That these power structures and these dynamics are ubiquitous, and us not liking it isn't going to change that. 
but then thinking, well, what purpose might I have in playing the game and doing so in a way that enables me to, to make a real positive difference? There's something I'd like to, to talk about in relation to the taboo side of power and the discussions around power, because it seems that it, it, it is quite taboo. And I think that Jeffrey Pfeffer mentions this in his book on power this taboo element and some sort of reference to it being more taboo in conversation than sex or money, which are seen as very, very kind of dirty things to, to talk about and, and very, very mucky things to, to be discussing in polite company. But power is, is said to be more taboo than that. And so we don't tend to talk about it directly, but yet when you look at popular culture, we talk about it all the time because we watch things like Game of Thrones. We watch things like House of Cards, these things that really do glorify the pursuit of power. So like you said, the terrain is such that power structures and power plays are ubiquitous, but so too in our popular culture, almost in our, in our cultural subconscious. These things are happening all the time around us. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that, that there is that disconnect between what comes out in the surface in polite conversation and what goes on underneath in the movies we watch and the programmes that we watch? Why do you think that is, just as a, as a general thought? That's a, that's a great observation, Tom. I think, first and foremost, the, world, the word power is still quite heavily associated with the world of politics. Uh, and also using the connection with, let's say, negative sides of this world. world. I mean, abuse of authority, um, you know, corruption or leveraging influence for personal gain. Uh, and I think those are the connotations that pop up most often. Hence, the power is almost like automatically associated with the bad sign of things. Mm. Plus, you know, there is a, a old saying that the bad news travel much faster and much further than the good news. So mm. it's easier to mention that in the context of a scandal or something mm. bad happening to get more clicks or more views or more readers mm. versus showing the power, as, as I mentioned already, is a tool. So it's your choice how you use it, for what purpose you use it. And you can have immense influence and leverage that for the world of good. But that wouldn't sell that well on one hand, probably. Mm. On the other, uh, it, it's not resonating so strongly with the popular belief because almost like mm, we tend to believe that good happens on its own. It's almost like a miracle that it's being created. Well, no, I mean, actually it is created because people who mm. have positive values and want to use it for good decided that they will fight for power and they will leverage that in a particular direction. Mm. And this is how it happens, how it surfaces. So I would say, uh, I would even risk a statement that it's almost our duty to make sure that we strive for power in one way or the other, just mm. to make sure that the bad guys do not get it, um, yeah. in a sense. So um, I would say probably that would be that would be one of the reasons. Plus, as you mentioned, the way how power is portrayed, even from the um, series that you've mentioned, Game of Thrones or uh, House of Cards, in both um, of those examples, power is per pursued absolutely ruthlessly with all ethics long forgotten and going to absolute extremes, you know. Um, I, I remember trying to catch up which characters of the Game of Thrones are actually alive throughout the whole season. <laughs> It was really difficult to trace because if there wasn't one or two corpses in in a particular episode, that was a really quiet one. Uh, mm. So um, so that portrays again almost like in a distorted mirror uh, yeah. that that's the way you pursue power. That it's absolutely ruthless. That you almost like step on dead bodies. Yeah. which can be in the real life, let's face it, but mm. there are other strategies, but they are also those who pursue it through offering something to others. They are those who build the network of people who will support them and then successfully leveraging that network to get things done. Mm. So um, there is a whole other you know, avenue or multiple avenues that, that you can become uh, influential, that you can make things happen Mm. Uh, without a long list of victims uh, yes. in your back. Yeah, because that's one of those sayings, isn't it? That 
that you don't make an egg with uh, you don't make an egg you don't make a, a a cake without cracking a few eggs and yeah. so and so that is i've heard that used by people to justify what you might call bad behavior or unethical behavior or they've, they've treated people badly a- along the way and they've justified that you know it's the the means and ends thing about justification and they, they've used that going back to your point you made an interesting point about good things not just happening by magic i think that's really interesting and it plays into this paradox of power because if we look at someone like say president lyndon b johnson or somebody like that who did masses of work and made massive progress in relation to civil rights legislation he was extremely ruthless in in his own pursuit of power yet he did actually do immense amounts of good with it as well not notwithstanding he wasn't by any means perfect and there was vietnam and everything else but there are so many this is such a complex area isn't it there are so many paradoxes at play that mean that values really are central to this and that the values of the individual because there are all these sayings the extent to which they're true or not is in the eye of the beholder and down to the circumstances but things along the lines of power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely so how can how can people pursue power in a way that doesn't involve cracking the eggs or standing on the corpses how can they pursue it in that ethical way and not themselves become corrupted by the pursuit of power as an end in itself I would say there are two additional kind of uh, elements which might be worth mentioning. One is that, well, power comes with a cost. Mm. And uh, I would say that pursuing power should be and uh, must be a conscious decision that at some point those costs will arise. Mm. And uh, first of all, first one would be visibility and scrutiny. You will be under public eye. If you go high enough, uh, you might lose your privacy. You will be, I don't know, followed by paparazzi. You will be asked questions by uh, journalists, etc. So that's one element. The other one, surprisingly, might be the loss of autonomy, Mm. Uh, meaning that you are not able to kind of, how to put it, made certain decisions completely uh, independently, but you have to consider this whole net of, different objectives, different goals that you pursue, but also goals of your network coming into play. Point number three, it's time and effort required. I mean, it really takes time and it's Mm -hmm. uh, quite obvious even after this short run of three months within the course that in order to really make uh, true progress and see that needle moving in terms of your influence, you need to get your hands dirty. It will not just come by itself. Mm-hmm. Point number four, I think, will be definitely trust issues. At some point, if you are high enough, you will start thinking whether the people who surround you are there because because of you, because of the values that you represent, because of the human person you are, mm-hmm. or because they really want a little bit of that power that you have. And last mm-hmm. but definitely not, not least, we had uh, examples where power becomes an addiction. Yes. And uh, we need to be kind of, you know, because from the first part of our conversation, it all might seem that it's, you know, the only thing to do, the only right thing to do. And uh, there are no costs associated. There are. Mm. And, uh, and you know, there is also a back kind of other side of the coin is when you start to lose power. Um, and there are certain reasons that might kind of bring you to it. For example, when you become overconfident or you lose your inhibitions to your point on values, when you start mm. going on the corpse uh, through the corpses or you are completely losing your values, that's, that's an alarm bell. It might be ignoring interests of others. So start uh, starting to kind of pursue the goal in itself without mm. keeping in mind that power comes from, uh, let's say, the networking, the connections that you have the uh, associations that you can showcase, et cetera, et cetera. Or again, as I mentioned, misplacing or offering too much trust to people who are there with malicious intent. Mm. Um, Last, but definitely not least, for example, others simply getting tired or losing patience uh, on the way how you pursue your goals 
or you know almost like when you do uh, when you play badly at the game and uh, it's less authentic less grounded and more into some automated let's say strategies full stop yeah. people will see through them sooner or later and then the you know the higher you climb the more painful the fall so to speak so in other words, in, in that's my big take on everything that surrounds the, the pursuit of power. And I'm, you know, I'm working with the currently with a big group of students within Stanford where we discuss all those um, kind of value dilemmas. Uh, it really works and enables you to keep your personality intact. It allows you to keep your values intact uh, with one kind of pivot that first of all you you have certain clarity about what your values are yes. because those again might differ we we you know among the two of us might create a list of values we believe are crucial in our lives and then we ask the next person and those will be completely different so we need to be conscious of that element too but uh, it allows you still to keep certain authenticity about you to still be true to the beliefs that you have and nevertheless progress on the on this let's say path to power because actually one of the probably most unleashing elements about this course compared to some of the works or some of the literature that i have read on the topic since uh, is that it's not that um linked to, I would say, destiny, meaning a lot of um, scholars writing on the topic of power mention that certain elements need to happen in order for you to get it. Like you need to be born in the right family, you need to be mm. born in the right country, you need to be born in the right time with the right resources like money or influence of your parents and almost like either you're predestined to have power or you're not, full mm. stop. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a bit of a, I would say, a pessimistic view and yeah. the one that definitely can suck out all the motivation out of you. Yeah. But yeah. then I'm a firm believer, especially after that particular course, because this is what, what is being constantly repeated throughout the book and throughout the course, is that um, you have ability to change your power stance or to change your level of influence almost irrespectively of where you sit. Mm. And it's heavily driven by your um, focus, your uh, motivation, your dedication to that goal, your meticulousness, hence the Excel file that I mentioned, and being really uh, systematic about it, really purposeful about it, really strategic about it. So, um, in other words, wherever you are, whomever you are, whatever your current uh, stockpile of influence is you can grow it mm. with a certain techniques and certain strategies and there are so many of those that it gives you almost like a choice yes. that's why there is such a big push within the course to actually try it with your own hands uh, because well i can bring up a metaphor uh, it's almost like teaching a kid or allowing the kids to try different tastes when he or she's growing up yeah. I remember when I was a little kid, uh, you know, you couldn't convince me neither for love nor money to try pickled herring. I yeah. hated that passionately. The sole thought made me cringe. But then I remember when I was in my 20s on one of the business parties, uh, I actually tried it not even knowing what it is. And mm. I was told uh, later on that this delicious thing, thing that I tried was actually the pickled herring, which I avoided for the majority of my life. There so the power is almost similar, meaning there are certain strategies which might make you cringe, might push you out of your comfort zone, especially if you are introvert yes. or, uh, you know, you are not that of a social person, you're not that uh, accustomed to putting yourself out there, self-promoting. That will be, a, you know, a, a big challenge to overcome those. But on the other hand, if you do try, you suddenly might realize that some of those strategies come to you naturally. Yes. That is still you, that your values were not changed, the, your personality was not changed, it got enhanced. Mm -hmm. And you, for example, have a natural talent to bridge people together or to offer help, but then to ask for some. You, have, you might have natural talent to speak in public. You might have natural talent to uh, you know, conduct webinars, to put yourself in the limelight. 
but unless you try you will never learn and this is mm-hmm. this is the ultimate uh, you know i think it's quite universal it does not refer to power does it i mean it, it refers yeah. to pretty much everything unless you try you will not discover those you know yeah. um biblical coins which you were given to invest and to grow and to expand and to discover mm, new things exactly wow there's, there's a lot there to, to to pick out and and really interesting and quite appropriate that the power course is empowering <laughs> um no no, <laughs> yes. no pun maybe the pun was intended i don't know but it is empowering this idea that it isn't just based on the color of your skin or your gender or where you're born or anything else but actually each and every person can be proactive and can increase their power and and i think because i was gonna i was gonna ask you the question about this but i decided not to but it's kind of come up anyway not not so much as a question but more as an observation the distinction between personal power so my power to do things have the power to create certain things or whatever it is make certain contributions and also the power over others in a hierarchical structure. And it seems that in order to have power in a hierarchical sense, power over, if you like, you first need to develop your skills at an individual level. You first need to develop your personal power, like you say, to step out of your comfort zone, to speak to more people, to network more, and to get comfortable in uncomfortable situations. So I find there's a really nice meshing of the the two things there where it doesn't have to be this dichotomous either or either we go for personal power or we go for having power over other people in a, in a hierarchy which is a zero-sum game you know these things can be meshed together but they can be meshed together for a worthy cause for a good contribution that doesn't just benefit me but also benefits the community and and the wider world as well i want to pick up something that you mentioned as well monica if i may about cost and leadership cost I also like I also really like the work of Ron Heifetz, who is based at the Harvard Kennedy School. He re- he's written a couple of books, one leadership on the line, which is re- I think he co-authored that with Marty Linsky, if I'm not mistaken. And that is I don't know if you've read it, but that's a fantastic book about the dangers, the inherent dangers of leadership. And actually what what those authors conclude towards the end of it, they they talk about how dangerous leadership is and how you were paying a real price to do this. You're putting yourself out in the limelight, but you're also getting tomatoes thrown at you as well when things don't go well. You're getting the scrutiny. Some leaders in, in dangerous places are even killed for the cause, so to speak. So you're not doing it just for self-aggrandizement. You're doing it. If you're doing it for the right reasons, you're doing it to make a, a larger contribution. And it comes back to, for, for these authors, for, for Heifetz and Linsky, it comes back to love. It comes back to love and having love for others and a, a greater cause. If you're doing it with you know real pure intent. And so I think it's important to, to bear those things in mind that we do have, appreciating the fact that everybody's got different values. It's appreciating the fact that there are some common values that we can agree on, you know, as, as that, that, that meshes all together as human beings that we can strive towards. And that's how we can build community. So it's not that I'm networking for my good or my benefit and you're going to suffer. It's that I'm networking to build my thing. You're networking to build yours and we can come together and we can work together. And it might sound twee, but, but I'm a very, very strong believer in the true principle of synergy, which is one of those things that, that has been it's it's been dumbed down it's been tainted by a lot of management speak and seen as a cliche but i really don't think it is this idea that things can be complementary and that the whole can be greater than the sum of its parts so this is a this is a wonderful conversation monica and i'm really glad that we've had it and i'm really glad that that we're bringing this to light because it power does not have to be it does not have to be a dirty word. It does not have to be a bad thing. It does not have to be something that we're ashamed of. It can be something that we can step into and move forward in really, as as Teddy Roosevelt put it, being the men and women in the arena and standing in the arena and, and moving forward. And I have to recommend as well, I, I pulled this out for this podcast, the book by Jeffrey Pfeffer as well. Power. Oh, the blue book. It's, yes, it's the, the blue book, as you call it. It's it's fantastic. I, I've, I'd read it already, but but prior to this conversation, I flicked through it and I was looking at some of the recommendations. I thought, this is fantastic. This is just generally, like you said before, generally, it's just good advice on networking. And some of the things really do take you out of your comfort zone. Like one of the things that 
that, that stood out to me was com- capacity to tolerate conflict. And I yes. thought that's so true because when you think about emotion and the power that emotion has in conversations and when somebody's being a bully, for example, they're using emotion. They're using somebody else's fear or insecurity to kind of ram ramrod their way through. And we've seen this. I'm not going to mention any names, but we've seen this in the wider world over the past recent years, shall we say, how this works. And so if we're going to stand up to tyrants and bullies in increasing our power, then we have to be able to take the heat. We have to be able to do that and be able to stand in ourselves and know, actually, this is where I stand. This is my hill, so to speak. And I'm going to defend this hill. So, so much good stuff in the book. So I would recommend that book personally. Monica, just in in closing, do you have a quick tidbit on what people can do to increase their personal power, besides, of course, taking the the lead course at Stanford? (laughs) Uh, That will be definitely the first recommendation. Secondly, definitely to have to, to, uh, you know, have an eye on, on the power course itself. But also, I would say that uh, getting over this taboo helps a lot. So that would be point number one. Point number two, taking the inspiration from the book you've just shown and honestly trying those strategies which are so meticulously and so pragmatically described there in their daily life and trying it, you know, step by step, bit by bit to find those which work best. Because as I think it surfaced so many times throughout our conversation, it really is about trying, about pivoting, about learning, about leveraging that and to be, you know, meticulous about it. But first and foremost, I think to start with acknowledgement that whether you like it or not, you are in the power game. You are already on this chessboard and it's up to you whether you take the passive stance or the active stance. Uh, And maybe, you know, also in conclusion, uh, one more comment to the brilliant points you've made, uh, both both in terms of, you know, uh, almost like diversity and inclusion. Professor is underlining that numerous times that uh, it kind of applies to everyone, irrespective of your geography, of your financial stance, of your skin color, of your education background. You can be anywhere. uh, You can have anything and you can still progress you can still grow mm. you you can almost hear the winds growing uh, in, let's say in the people who who heard that particular statement mm. and the other element that um i would say you mentioned about kind of positive values and underlying values which bring us all together that it does not have to be uh, you know i win you lose Mm. sort of thing and I think that one of the communities that embodies that is exactly elite community why because there you see this overwhelming willingness to grow not only by yourself but also to help others and the power that it unleashes in a very natural way it's absolutely overwhelming it's almost unstoppable because suddenly you realize you have allies you are in a safe space you where you can express your opinions and you can hear uh, you know genuine honest feedback and you can learn and pivot from it so i would wholeheartedly echo your words but again also to to add more kind of pun intended power to your to your mention about the bullies yes If we have certain power built up, we can take our stance against somebody who is in conflict with our values, who who we perceive as the person, you know, with the malicious intent. But in order to do that effectively, we need to build power ourselves. So that brings me to repeating the same point. Don't leave that to the bad guys. That's a great place to end it. Monica Stazuska-Crook, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Tom. It was a pleasure.